Right. So welcome, welcome once again to the Coronavirus Daily. This is week four and it is the much delayed episode 13 and I am Ajay Ponya. The reason I've been MIA, even though the show is called Daily, is because, well, there is no news. Look around you. All the news that's fit to print is being crushed in eight pages or 10 pages or maximum 12. Look at your favorite newspaper. If you're still getting it, that is. It has shrunk, hasn't it? And on a related note, it took me five days to come up with bulletins to fit in my gun. So like I said earlier, time has slowed down. Collectively, all of us are waiting to get vaccinated or at least get an effective treatment. So as the prime minister announced yesterday, 19 days of this waiting period will have to happen while still being at home. But we're still the same people. No matter the situation, pandemic or otherwise, our mutations will still fulfill the wretched criteria that as humans, we must keep arguing over social media. So today, I'm going to be providing you with some meat, some masala that you can garnish your arguments with. While you indulge with WhatsApp uncles till you are finally shitting bricks when they say elders must be respected. As responsible individuals, our obligation is to educate ourselves and respect the elders. The date today is 15th April, in the middle of what seems like a never-ending Sunday. First, the uncertain. So what unites the world's countries right now, apart from the coronavirus, is the way all of us have mishandled it. No exceptions. Specifically, the horrendously slow rollout of testing. Although Sweden may argue in favor of herd immunity, but I'll come to that later. To beat the virus and stop its spread, WHO says we need to identify those infected and isolate them, whether or not they're symptomatic. While we also need to find out which communities are likely to be impacted by coronavirus and thus allocate resources in anticipation of rising cases. But there is also an urgent need to identify who has been infected and is immune to the virus, if not permanently, then at least for a while. And that can happen with blood tests or serological tests looking for antibodies to the virus that will answer whether an individual was once upon a time infected with the virus. In the absence of reliably, reliably enough data, we have no way to answer with confidence how widespread the infection is, what is the mortality rate and what measures will actually work. Lockdown or herd immunity. Anything can be argued in favor of. Antibody tests, however, may answer some of these questions. Once we know who these people are or groups are, these people can afford some semblance of normality, normalcy. But you may be wondering, how are the antibody tests different from the ones that are currently being done? But if you're not wondering, you should. So the COVID-19 test looks for viral genetic material in patient samples using a method called polymerized chain reaction. This method amplifies the coronavirus RNA as soon as infection begins. Remember, SARS-CoV-2 is a RNA virus. The viral RNA stays in the body till the immune system throws it out. So the PCR test, polymerized chain reaction test, identifies who currently has the virus. Doesn't matter if they're not showing symptoms. And since a lot of people remain asymptomatic with the virus, and there aren't enough test kits and we don't know who are these people with antibodies in them and are forced to stay home because of the no exemption lockdown mandated by authorities. Please note, antibodies take a few days to kick in after the infection takes over. So antibody tests are not useful to identify who is currently infected. Antibody tests only identify past cases. Also, as opposed to the PCR test, which may take days to deliver results, the good news is antibody tests take only a few minutes. However, there is one limitation with antibody tests, or a few actually. That is, it does not answer whether the person is contagious right now. Damn, so what do we do? We combine the PCR test, that is, test positive for immunity through an antibody test and then the negative for the virus through a PCR test. Basically means you don't have COVID-19 now, you had it earlier, but what do you have now? Antibodies. Awesome, right? Oh, 
I forgot. There's one more thing. The accuracy of serological tests. Sorry, but there are various ways in which the serological test can give a false negative or false positive. One, it may say that you had COVID-19 even when you had antibodies against a different type of coronavirus, like flu, for example. Two, your antibody tests may not stay positive for very long. You don't have antibodies anymore. And three, this one's very frustrating. Uh, what if you take the test during the period when antibodies haven't kicked in after the infection has found a home in you? The period between the end of COVID-19 and beginning of antibody production by your body. Remember, while the infection is still set in you, the result is unlikely to be accurate. Also recall, I spoke of Chinese kits being returned by European countries. This is precisely why. So annoying, right? Oh, can I, can I put in one more? Because COVID-19 is a new disease, the period of immunity is yet unknown. We don't know if it is as low as tetanus or long, as long-lasting as chickenpox. Some early stage studies suggest that COVID-19 patients have antibodies for at least all of two weeks. In all honesty, humans have only been with the virus for about 100 odd days. So long term data will require spending long term with the virus. Yay. How cool. And one final one, please. Um, right now, it is also unclear whether antibodies would prevent infection from exposure to a large amount of virus, for example, like a hospital setting. And now for the good, the bad and the ugly. The good. In every episode, in some way or the other, I communicate the message that without vaccine, nothing's gonna happen. Life won't go back to the BC, the before coronavirus era. So I thought it was a good time to know what exactly are the approaches that are being tried out for the vaccine. But first, let me give you a humble reminder. It's at least a year away because clinical trials do take time. But at least the frontline workers can be given a promising vaccine in an extremely con controlled manner during this time. So before it reaches us mortals, aram se, itminan se, koi indoor hobby apnaye, aur meri baat ukaur se sunye. So what is a vaccine? A vaccine is a stimulus for the immune system to prepare it against a future pathogen attack. It is an anticipatory device as opposed to a treatment. It's like a self-defense class wherein you train yourself with dummy opponents for a tomorrow when you actually encounter a knife-wielding street gangster. But before that tomorrow comes, there will be many tomorrows. So today, in preparation for that tomorrow, you take a vaccine. Now, vaccine development is risky territory, mind you, because it is given to healthy individuals. Drugs and antibodies, on the other hand, are easier because they are given to sick individuals. The whole world is currently after creating the vaccine. Is because... Is because... Okay, let us. The world is able to work towards a vaccine because of early Chinese efforts to sequence the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2. They did that in early January. So, how does one go about creating a vaccine? A person is exposed to a killed or a very weak pathogen to tell the body that prepare yourself, defense for something like this. It's like spoon feeding the cells. They go, aisa kuch khatarnaak saayega. Jab aayega, to ready rena, huh? Okay. And then the body prepares its self-defense response or what we call immunity. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, a receptor in human cells called ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 seems to offer an entry to the virus. That's the window that this virus uses to take over the cell. I didn't say door knob because it's an uninvited and unwelcome guest. So, as a chori chipe, ACE2 window se andar aata hai. Thus, it is believed ACE2 could be the key to unlocking the vaccine. Now, for the development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, a similar approach is being used and there are 70 vaccines that are in the works globally. So let me skim through some of these approaches. Though Moderna, an American company, is using an alternate method, they are trying to generate antibodies against the spike proteins of the virus. The spikes that you've seen in the images of the virus that's also in the logo of this channel. Because these spikes attach themselves to the host cell to imitate the infiltration, and so the idea is to make antibodies targeting the viral spike proteins. What Germany's CureVac is doing is creating an RNA-based vaccine 
In this approach, RNA that codes for some of the coronavirus proteins is introduced into the body against which the body can then synthesize antibodies. Apiron Biologics of Austria is offering the virus a lot more of ASTO in an attempt to flood the virus with confusion. Veer Biotechnology and Alinum Pharma of US are applying the opposite. Both offer less of ACE2, thinking the virus will struggle to control the body with less to hold on to. Interestingly, understanding ACE2 took scientists a long time. ACE2 is usually found in lung, kidney, heart and gut cells. But scientists very recently identified that ACE2 receptors uh, can also be in people's noses. Kind of like an aha moment. The bad. And now it has begun. The easing of lockdowns are here. Sitting in India, I feel a teeny bit jealous. Thoda sa. Talking about the dreamlands of China, Spain and Austria, where lockdowns have been lifted and some movement has begun. It's good only they can be seen as rehearsals for us and France and UK who have taken the same route as us. In the big debate of lockdown extension versus herd immunity, the result of these mass experiments will offer us one certainty, which is evidence, a very crucial one. The lack of statistical evidence and conclusive proofs have led to different countries taking widely different approaches. All models, all studies have the disclaimer based on limited data available. That isn't written in fine print, but writ large in bold letters. As Guardian summed it up perfectly, we simply don't have models that balance the direct, visible and dramatic harms of COVID-19 with the more indirect, chronic and hidden social and economic harms of lockdown. And now, the ugly. Across the globe, we're all in this thing together, weathering a shared experience and deploying the tactics against a common enemy. But even though against an identical threat, the thing that, divide, that divided us before, such as borders and national wealth, still play a role in which, in, in which part of humanity gets what. Purchasing power counts for as much as what it did earlier. You either buy the produce or you buy the farm. Scientists in Africa and Latin America have been told by manufacturers that orders for vital testing kits cannot be fulfilled for months because the supply chain is in upheaval and almost everything they produce is going to America or Europe. All countries report steep price increases from testing kits to masks. Countries need to understand that the virus is a global problem. As long as it exists somewhere, it can exist everywhere. This is where the Western hypocrisy is at its most distilled. Every day we hear that we have to lock down to save lives and that every life matters. Granted. Every day we hear that we are all in this together. But of course, every life is not equal, nor are we all in this together. That's why resources are not being shared rationally. Healthcare has long been a, a great source of inequality and that has not changed with the coronavirus. The wealthier your household, your city or your country, the better healthcare you will receive. And the less likely you will be to get sick and less likely you will be to die. At some point, capitalism became the goal in itself and ceased to be just a useful tool to serve humanity. There is really a war going on behind the scenes and poorer countries are losing out. But to be honest, that war has been going on behind the scenes since the beginning of time. Before I go, the funnies. Well, there's a lot of debate about how the insurance industry viewed and will view pandemics post the ongoing one, whenever it ends in this decade. But there is one big gainer from this pandemic, and that's the sporting event Wimbledon. Well, the annual summer strawberry and cream stubborn all whites congregation is not happening. But before I break it to you, how they're the biggest gainer, let me give you a quick lesson in history. Post the SARS outbreak in 2003, Wimbledon had the foresight to buy around annual $1.9 million pandemic insurance. Shelling out roughly $31.7 million in these 17 years, they're all set to receive $142 million for this year's cancelled tournament, making it a very, very sensible investment. But it's not like the organizers are jumping with joy. While tournament cancellation does save about $38 million in prices and wages because of the cancellation, it is still a huge loss of income. Wimbledon makes about $360 million every year in media rights, sponsorship and gate tickets. 
amongst all the other bleeding sporting organizations, Wimbledon will find itself in a much stronger position. To put into perspective, had they invested the 2 million every year in the market, uh, they would have been worth approximately 90 million before the pandemic wounded the stock markets. Hmm. So, am I saying a tennis tournament was better prepared than most of the world's governments? Damn right, I am. Goodbye, wash your hands, see you later.